light within my heart, light within my thoughts, light within my words. May one and all and everything, blessed and love it ever be. Welcome. I am Sister Who. I was reflecting the other day on a TV show that was on many years ago called Babylon 5, in which there were two advanced races, uh, one called the Vorlons and one called the Shadows. And there was a philosophical question that was used to identify each of them. Uh, and uh, curiously, or, or for better or worse, I guess, the Vorlons were always asking the question, who are you? And the shadows were always asking the question, what do you want? And in, con in meditating on those two questions, it was kind of fascinating to me how who are you starts inside and moves outward, and everything comes from who you are. And the other question, the shadows, which curiously in the show were depicted as these giant black spiders, uh, we're always asking, what do you want? And which is kind of the outside in. And one of the challenges of that is the people who decide, the people who are ambitious, but not only ambitious, they, they were greedy and uh, in some ways narcissistic. They would tell the shadows what they wanted and the shadows would make it happen. And then they would have to live with how that uh, usually negatively impacted them on the inside. That uh, what they wanted, and as they accumulated it, they found themselves less empowered, uh, less loving, less wise, less free, less everything. Uh, but for the Vorlons, um, to start with who are you, it was something that was always growing and expanding and becoming more light. And yet, in the final battle in the middle of the series, when the Vorlons and the shadows really go after each other directly, it uh, was kind of how did it, was, it was described in the series as something like um, two, um, I don't know, demigods going after each other, and all the other races and people in the way were just, um, what's that dreadful term? Um, collateral damage? Uh, that they really weren't concerned about who got hurt in the process as long as they destroyed each other. Uh, which is not at all what you would think of an advanced uh, mentality or consciousness. And so even in that sense, it was made clear that they were not particularly perfect uh, species. Um, but going back before that, because every metaphor has a point at which it breaks down, but the, the basic point I wanted to address within this episode was uh, wrestling with these questions. Who are you and what do you want? And how much do the two have in common? Does what you want change as you develop more of a sense of who you are? And uh, a lot of people are looking at me, of course, as being this incredible anomaly and going around with the painted face and everything else. And, and I say, yes, but this is who I am. And that doesn't really make a lot of sense to a lot of people. And I've had even a few people accuse me of hiding within the costume, as if I'm concealing who I truly am or something. And I said, no, when, when I'm dressed this way, you know who Sister Who is. And there are all sorts of values and priorities and perceptions and things that, that, are, that describe Sister Who that are obvious when I'm in ritual garb. But when I'm not uh, dressed in ritual garb and I don't have my face paint on, then essentially I could be anyone. I look just like anyone else, I'm a very ordinary sort of person. And so in that sense, not being in face paint and ritual garb actually conceals who I truly am much better than being Sister Who. It's, it's kind of um, everything I am on the inside brought to the outside where it can be seen and shared. And it, it kind of showing up for life and saying, yes, but this is what I have to share. Um, I grew up in a world that where being gay was so not talked about, I didn't know what gay was. It was just some word I saw in the headlines of the newspaper, but I really didn't understand it. Um, I knew it was different from the time I was four, or maybe earlier, but I didn't know what it was. So when I finally figured out I was gay, uh, for me it wasn't that much of a struggle. It was just a question of coming to something that was true and saying, oh, 
well, why didn't somebody tell me? Now it all makes sense. And so then I wanted to make up for lost time of figuring out what it meant to be gay. And so that's how I wound up at the 1990 Gay Games in Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada, and which is where I met my spiritual godmother, Sister X, and the whole progression of becoming Sister who started. But it was a curious sort of um, wrestling with social pressures around me, I guess, because I discovered I was gay and I came out and immediately I ran into uh, pressure in certain factions, not overall, but in certain corners, there was pressure that if you're going to be gay, it means this. And if you're going to be gay, it means that. And I said, well, I, I want the broadest understanding that I can get. So I found out about the gay games and I, I looked at all the different sports. I didn't know of any team to join and I never, I've been, always been such an anomaly in about half a dozen different ways that I never really knew what to do as far as team sports. So I looked at all the individual sports and I picked the one for which I felt least qualified because I thought that would give me the most learning and growth and experience and it would prove the most to myself. So that's how I wound up in my first ever bodybuilding competition. And because uh, it was a sport for which I felt least qualified. Um, uh, but it, it turned out wonderfully all in all. But, but going to the gay games was odd because after I had signed up and begun exercising and so forth, I discovered that there was a group um, going from the state in which I was living that um, you know, wanted everyone to join this team for that state. And I, I had a little problem with it though because I had just come out, I was discovering the newness of being gay and being out and having a, a quote unquote gay community. I don't know how much they really act like a community, but um, suddenly having all these other people to associate with who were gay or lesbian and suddenly I had something in common with them even though I'd never met them before. And so I wanted to go to the gay games so I could get the perspective of what it means to be gay from as many different voices around the world, because uh, this was an international event. But then the people who were associated with the team for that state uh, informed me that I was not allowed to put a pink triangle or a rainbow flag on my uniform. And I said, for he good heavens, why not? We're going to the gay games for crying out loud. And what was made clear to me is that a lot of people on the team were not out. They wanted to go to the gay games in another country, in another city, and participate and have fun and make a big party of it, but didn't want anyone back home in, at, in their hometown to find out. And so they wanted to have a, a costume or a team uniform that they could wear that wouldn't betray them to anyone they hadn't come out to and that they weren't planning to come out to. And I basically said, are you out of your mind? Uh, this whole thing is about being out, about saying, who are you? And answering the question with a real loud cheer and uh, a real happiness and exuberance at finally getting to be who and what you are. And, uh, my exp and so, I made my own jacket and came up with my own personal logo that had a great big pink triangle and three rainbow flags and it was just as out as could be. And it wasn't that I was being effeminate, but I suppose in some sense I was being flamboyant in that I wasn't giving, I wasn't leaving any room for doubt. Uh, anyone who saw me in that jacket knew exactly where I stood. But the wondrous thing about that first experience of the gay games, which I don't know how it's, I don't know if it's that true anymore, but, but it was wonderfully true in Vancouver in 1990, is that I arrived for eight days of the gay games and it was like the entire world had been reversed because there were so many gays and lesbians there for the gay games that everywhere you went, the majority of people were gay or lesbian and the straight people were the minority. It was just the most incredible, wonderful feeling to suddenly not be the anomaly and not be the one who didn't belong. And, but still it leaves me this question, so, but who are you? So you have this group identity you like to share, but, but you can't collapse into the group identity because then you still won't be yourself. And so 
um, that's where I met Sister X and started this evolution uh, and development of Sister Who. And it was actually Sister X who gave me my, my name. Uh, it was, and it was like an epiphany. It was just a flash of recognition. We were on the phone one night and he said, considering that your whole life has been one long identity crisis, you should be Sister Who does she think she is? And it stuck. For the last 30 years, it stuck. Um, and so I became Sister Who after that and then had to figure out how it all looked and how it fit together. And um, I actually wrote a song that I put on my first album um, that uh, asked a lot of the questions and, you know, in a very small way, I guess, um, addresses um, the whole external representation of Sister Who. You know, because Sister Who could have looked a hundred different ways. Um, but as Sister X advised, for the first three years, the face makeup kind of evolved and then stayed the way it, it is now. And for the first perhaps six or seven years, the ritual garb evolved through a variety of different configurations and then kind of landed where it is now and it stayed that way ever since. Um, because it took that long to figure out you know, it, it didn't take as long, curiously, to figure out who I was on the inside. It took longer to figure out how I was supposed to look on the outside. And it wasn't so much that I decided how I was supposed to look as that I would see pictures or draw ideas and I would just know that looks right. And so I would keep it. Um, in any case, um, I'd like to share that song with you now.
If I had to answer the Vorlan's questions, though, or rather the Shadow's question, what do you want? I guess what it comes down to is I want to be me, and I want a world that will let me be me. And I would think that that would be a similar sort of goal for a lot of other people, that you can be all these other things, and you can want all these other things, you can have all these other things, but if all you have is things, in the end, you're empty. And, uh, but then on the flip side, I heard somebody say once that it's just stuff. But the people I've heard say it's just stuff more often treat people as objects also and are not really committed to the people in their lives. To me, there's a sense in which everything is alive and it all can answer the question of who are you. And it all has something that it wants. And in most cases, what it wants is to be loved. And like the story of the Velveteen Rabbit, the more you love something, the more you make it real. And if you love something long enough, if someone loves you long enough, it makes you real in a way that you can never be unreal again, except to people who don't understand. Um, that story should be required reading for everyone because it is so profound on that point and it's so timeless. If I had to say what I wanted, what I want is for everyone to have the freedom to be whoever and whatever they are and to take whatever they are and whoever they are and raise it to the level of an art, to strive for excellence, to not, you know, as the uh, song by a particularly country western singer, Casey Mulgraves, am I remembering that right? Um, one of the lines of her song talks about we only get so many trips around the sun. and you know, elderly people will tell you life is short and it's over too quickly. And with all of that in mind and the awareness that we're going to run out of time, it just really impresses upon me the need to make each moment count, not in an obsessive, compulsive sort of way, but in a sense of treating each moment as a field to be sown and cultivated and tilled until something wonderful is produced, possibly that has never existed before. I've been told over and over that there are no two snowflakes that are exactly alike, and it seems to me that people are as unique as snowflakes. And in one sense, it's all snow, and yet there is an individuality to each snowflake that is uh, incredible artistry that should be appreciated and valued and shared. And each individual person, um, gay, straight, lesbian, bi, trans, whatever, we're getting into an age uh, and I hope it continues to grow, but there have been times in the past where things grew and then suddenly there was a backlash and everything went quiet again. Um, an age where there's more people coming out about whoever and whatever they are in terms of spirituality, in terms of race, in terms of the infinite combinations. I, I love in the realm of Star Trek uh, where the basic philosophy of the Vulcans is infinite diversity and infinite combination. That every single person is unique and every combination of people is unique and every combination will produce more unique combinations and it's infinite diversity. You'll never get to the end of how many different ways there are to be. And if you, if you preoccupy yourself with what do you want, you may never get around to figuring out who you are. If, on the other hand, if everything grows from who you are, if what you want, you want because of who you are, it seems to me that it snowballs in the direction of love and of creative development, and there are treasures hidden within each person that unless they have the freedom to be themselves will never come out, and the world will never know. And, you know, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Madame Curie, all these different incredible people in history who, are only, who only made history by being the unique individuals that they were, not by trying to fit in to some prevailing social norm. And so as Sister Who, I give myself a lot of freedom to do it differently. And as an autistic person who uh, sees the detail in life and orients to the details rather than to the generalities, and uh, I was having a discussion with someone just recently about the definition of the word disability. And it seems to me what it really means is that you can't do it just like everyone else. You have to do it your own way. 
You have to be totally unique and totally different. And if you're able to do that, you will have something special to give to the world that no one else can give. And if you don't give it to the world, the world will never have it. Um, it's that important and that essential. And you only get a certain amount of time in this life to make that contribution and to be yourself and to shine your unique light. And if you don't do it, in that specific sense, the world will remain dark. And if you, if unfortunately, like my biological family, if you don't want any openly gay person in your life, then that means that the light that only a gay person can bring will never be there, and that will be whole areas of your life that will remain in darkness. And on one hand, you can make that choice, but I don't know why you would want to. Um, in a way, it'd be, it's fleeing from your own life. There are so many people whose lives have been enriched by the creations of Shakespeare and uh, various architects in the past and artists of all sorts because they did what they did and left something behind when they were gone, there is something that expands our vision and our insight and our definitions of what is really possible. And things that everyone thought were impossible, only th they only thought they were impossible until so-and-so did them. Um, and I, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but I saw a wonderful little plaque one time that said, those who do not believe something is possible should not interfere with those who are in the process of doing it. Um, and uh, I read somewhere quite a number of years ago, uh, a lot of people are fond of quoting, uh, if man were meant to fly, he, God it would have given him wings. Do you know who said that? It was the uncle of Orville and Wilbur Wright, who happened to be a Methodist minister. <laughs> Talk about close juxtaposition. They were in the process of proving that flight was possible, even though their overly religious uh, and ordained uncle didn't believe them. He told them not to do it. He told them it's impossible. They thankfully didn't listen to him, and that's how we had Orville and Wilbur Wright making that airplane fly when nobody thought it could be done. And there's so many other things, too, where people said it was impossible until somebody went out and did it. And I don't know that we should ever embrace that word impossible as much as exploring what would it take. And on that note, I guess, for my own life story, it's what would it take for me to find out who I am? Uh, what would it take for someone else to find out what they, what they want? And well, if it's what you want, to some extent it means having it and then figuring out whether or not you wanted it. because. There are a lot of people who have gotten things that they wish for and then found it kind of empty. Like, I thought it would make me happy to have this, but I'm not. Um, where on the other hand, if people find out who they are, um, there's a wonderful little movie that was n wasn't very widespread as far as I can tell, but it was made, I think, way back in the 70s, in 1970s. But it was called I Am the Cheese. Um, and it's it's portrayed in a way that's kind of a, a brain teaser because, and I don't want to spoil it for you by telling you all of it, but it basically is one story that's being told and another story that's being shown, and you find out how the two interact at the end, that you've really been given two very different views, and they're really the same, but until you get to the end of the movie, you don't understand how the two fit together. And then it all makes sense. And one of the last things the, um, the protagonist, this young man in the movie, says uh, before he escapes from where he's being ref confined, um, is that now I know who I am, and I don't ever have to be afraid again, ever. You know, it's kind of like the, the story of the Velveteen Rabbit, finally becoming real, and you can never be unreal again except to people who don't understand. And then you live your life, but you live your life in a way that is not a reflection of them, of their smallness. It's an answer to that smallness by becoming the biggest, most wonderful, most beautiful person you can possibly be, and becoming an intersection of the spiritual and the physical and the mental and the social and everything all in one person. This multidimensional miracle that uh, has the ability to change the way humanity and the world thinks. Um, I, to me, it kind of comes back to that wonderful African word I discovered a few years ago, uh, Ubuntu, which uh, 
as explained to me, is essentially translated, I am because we are, and we are because I am. We can't be who we are unless each individual is who they are. And each individual cannot be who they are unless there is a whole lot of people supporting them in that. Uh, I always loved the weddings that I attended in the past where the minister would have the couple pr pronounce their vows to each other and then turn to the congregation and say, are all of you going to, do all of you commit to supporting this couple in being the loving couple that they commit themselves to being today? And the whole congregation would answer, we do. And that's where a marriage is really a communal thing. And it's just, it's about two people who love each other enough to commit uh, everything that they are uh, to each other in spite of having no idea where the future is going to go. And we don't know where the future is going to go in terms of what I have or what I want, because my wants keep changing. But I do know where the future is going to go if I find out who I am and live that out. Thank you very much for watching. I hope some of the things I've said in the last half hour have been helpful to you. And now may you be blessed with love and peace in the pursuit of your own dreams and in all your dealings with the diversity of humanity around you. Amen.